Great. Well, thank you all so much for joining us for Beachcombing for Signs of Wildlife with the Mass Audubon. From the rolling dunes of Cape Cod to the rocky North Shore, the beaches of Massachusetts offer unique opportunities for life to converge. Learn how to read the landscape, search for wildlife, and understand the ecological relationships between species you may be familiar with. How do horseshoe crabs, uh, least turn, ribbed mussel, and people interact on the coastline? Explore best practices when combing the beach in search for wildlife clues and leave with recommendations from Mass Audubon teachers and naturalists on the best places to explore. And this presentation is led by Douglas Lowry, who's the adult education specialist for Mass Audubon's Southeast region. Uh, he's also a senior field instructor for the National Outdoor Leadership School. Uh, so all 70 of us or so, let's give a big virtual round of applause to Douglas for joining us here today. And Douglas, you can take it away. Thanks so much. You're welcome, Robert. And thank you for that introduction. I'm very excited to be here this morning. Uh, I love the fact that we have folks from all corners of the state and beyond New Mexico. We'll do our best to, um, oh, we'll get nostal nostalgic with you. Uh, so it's a pretty fat packed presentation. So the pace will go pretty fast. Uh, we've got about 60 slides here, so I won't spend any more than a minute on some of them. So off we go. Here is uh, an agenda, uh, and we'll stick to this uh, pretty closely. Uh, some of it will overlap. So we're going to start with intertidal habitats and communities, kind of describe the differences between some of the unique uh, coastal environments that we have along the coast. We'll provide a few tools and resources that um, can really help uh, enhance your experience as you visit the shore. And then we'll go through a, a number of photographs of what you're likely to find and why the things you're going to find are so special. As you can imagine, uh, there's some really unique adaptations with the creatures and uh, plants that we find along our coastline. And then we'll finish by talking about some of the uh, places that, along the Massachusetts coast where you might find uh, some really uh, great beach combing. So off we go. We would like to start though with an acknowledgement. And we at Mass Audubon acknowledge wildlife, uh, uh, sorry, that Mass Audubon's wildlife sanctuaries are located on the traditional contemporary and unceded territories of several indigenous nations, including the Massachusett, the Mohican, the Nauset, the Nipmuc, the Penacook, the Pocomtuck, the Wabanaki, and the Wampanoag. These lands were taken from the indigenous people, creating a legacy of trauma that persists to this day. We acknowledge that indigenous stewardship of the land we now call Massachusetts kept its ecologically ecological communities vibrant, strong, and interconnected for thousands of years. But far from being relics of the past, indigenous peoples, including the 37,000 individuals who currently reside in Massachusetts, are still at the forefront of environmental protection, ecological stewardship, and climate mitigation. I often start my presentations with a quote that um, is, uh, dear to my heart, and Rachel Carson's one, I think just an amazing uh, source for these. So she, in every outthrust headland and every curving uh, grain of sand, there's a story of the earth. So what do we describe as a coastal environment? Well, here's, um, here's some examples. So we're down here on the South Shore and we're looking down at Duxbury Beach and it's a seven plus um, nautical mile uh, barrier beach. And it is a stalwart uh, protector of both the towns of Duxbury and Kingston. Uh, and it's joined by another barrier beach uh, that, that helps this large bay, uh, Plymouth. Long Beach and Plymouth, and that protects Plymouth as well. And so you can see a little bit of that on the, on the right-hand side on the chart, Plymouth B 
speech coming up from the center of the photograph going north. And what these barrier beaches do is protect the inland waters from winter storms pri primarily. And the community, not only the bay, but the communities uh, in the bay, along the bay. And they provide that protection that they provide off, offer an opportunity for salt marshes and mud flats to start establishing. Uh, and that's often where we find ourselves when we're exploring uh, tidal, uh, co coastal tidal areas. So we will talk about that in more detail as we go. But on the chart, if you look at the areas of blue, uh, charts will measure the bathometry of the ocean floor. In other words, the areas and uh, that are under sea. And so they have depths rather than heights like a topographic map. And those blue areas are areas that of alike depths. And then you get into the green areas and those are areas that are awash at low tide. In other words, if uh, the tide was out, all these areas of green would be exposed. And a lot of them are mud flats, but a lot of it is uh, salt marsh as well. So when we define beach combing, beach combing kind of traditionally is uh, the very, um, oh, leisurely walk down the beach and see what you see kind of thing. Uh, but there's other, other ways to explore coastal environments as well. You can explore the salt marsh habitat specifically uh, you can walk the rack line, which is essentially the floatsome and jetsome that is dispersed up on the beach from the latest tide. Or you can go tide pooling where it's appropriate. A lot of the rocky shorelines, uh, especially on the north shore of Massachusetts and a little bit down in Buzzards Bay, uh, lend themselves to have some great tide pooling where uh, there is the absence of sand, essentially, and so the uh, intertidal life is a little different. You'll, you'll see that there's some shared uh, community members in both uh, habitats, but uh, tide, tide pooling is a whole different uh, subject. And then there's also exploring the mud flats, and we'll talk about that as we go. So this is a generalization, but we're looking at the Massachusetts coastline, and you can kind of divide it up. Uh, four ways. So we have barrier beaches, which we just described as Duxbury Beach being uh, an, a great example of it. And so a lot of our out-facing, out ocean-facing beaches are barrier beaches. And those are essentially all part of the geological history of glaciation. They're all parts of those terminal moraines that you probably remember back in uh, middle school geology. Then we have what we call mainland beaches, uh, things that um, they're more stalwart, they're, they're certainly less fluid than our barrier beaches. They're well-established. Uh, they are not subject to erosion as much as, or, or offshore currents as our barrier beaches. Uh, we also have these bluff with linear beach. And if you're familiar with the Cape Cod National Seashore up in Truro and around the corner into Provincetown, you see this very uh, cliff-like uh, geology that's basically sand that drops off and then spills out into the ocean in a kind of uh, a, what we define as a, a beach. And then Rocky Coast, again, up. Uh, on our North Shore, Rockport area, um, and then a little bit here and there. And you can find pockets of this. Uh, Cohasset down on the South Shore has a little as well. Another thing we're looking at with, with uh, coastal uh, viewing is that it depends a lot on the season. So here's a generalization. Our winter storms uh, change the profile of our beaches by having a more dynamic wave action. And so as winter storms come in, they hold more, they pack more of a punch and they pull more of the fine uh, mineral 
sand and soil away from the beach, exposing the rocks. Uh, and as summer comes along, those waves are more gentle and they have a tendency to deposit some of the finer grains of sand up on the beach and the uh, receding wave doesn't pull it back out into the ocean like it does in the winter. So in the winter time, many sandy beaches uh, that you're uh, familiar with in the, in the summertime might look drastically different, uh, but the creatures there are all pretty much the same that you see in the summer. They just have to adapt a little differently. And so you can overturn rocks and find crevices and that kind of thing and find the same species of, of uh, animals that you would in the, in the summer. Another consideration when we're tide pooling or uh, beach combing is the tides. Yes, and Massachusetts has diurnal tides, which means we have two cycles. And so um, a tide cycle is one high tide plus a successive low tide. Uh, and due to land masses and the geology of our coastline, uh, the movement of water around the earth uh, is is uh, impeded in places. And so the resulting tide cycle pattern um, can, can really depend on the geographic location. So there are times when on the, um, on the ocean side of Massachusetts, we might have a 12, 12 foot tide differential between low and high tide. If you sneak around into Buzzards Bay, at the same time we're having a 12 foot tide in say Boston Harbor, they might be having a three and a half or a four foot tide. And that's all about uh, filling in these vacuums uh, at different rates by the, because of the volume and the shape of the geography. However, everything is subject to the, uh, the cycle of tides. And so there is here a low, low tide that rises fairly slow to start, speeds up, slows down and then re recedes back down to a high low tide. The next tide comes in, slows down towards the end of the cycle and becomes a high tide, a high, high tide. So it gets a little confusing, but the, the things to, uh, to remember is that the lower the tide, the more access you're gonna have to intertidal uh, habit, habitat and the creatures that live there. So here's a little um, rule, if you will. It's the rule of twelfths. So let's use a 12 foot differential as an example. So it's 12 feet from low tide to high tide. And in the first cycle of that tide, that six hour cycle is the tide rises from nothing and then um, up to the highest tide. In the first hour, one twelfth of that volume of water will come in. In the second hour, two twelfths, and so on and so forth. So tides start off very slow as they come in and then move very fast towards the middle and then start dropping back down towards the end. And so if you look at either end of those tide cycles, that's probably the best time to go visit uh, for tide pooling and mud uh, flat. This is a picture from our Wellfleet um, Sanctuary, uh, and it's a boardwalk that goes through a salt marsh out to the uh, barrier beach. And um, yeah, keeping track of the tides can be uh, pretty consequential. Uh, so let's talk about some of the unique qualities of the things that we find in our intertidal zone. So these are things that uh, creatures have to deal with as they have chosen to live in this environment. Lots of salinity, okay? Because of the tides, the salt water comes in and out. Uh, we have uh, the tides going up and down. And so we've got salt and freshwater influence. Uh, often our salt marshes certainly have, uh, have to have a freshwater source. Uh, we have extreme seasonal temperatures. You can see them there. And then the seasonal water temperatures as well. Uh, sometimes there's very little shade in intertidal zones. 
uh, and then you are subject to predation from all sorts of areas, the sand, land, sea, and air. There's an intermittent food supply. If you are a filter feeder, you have to wait it out until the next tide comes in. You are processing toxins. A lot of uh, agricultural uh, and residential runoff, mostly in the form of some of our uh, <clears throat> nitrogen. And, and then we have sea level rise in the mix. If you are a mussel that is harvested, you might get over harvested. And then we have the introduction of non-native species. Uh, that has really made a difference in a lot of our habitats. Um, so there's a lot of things you've got to be prepared for uh, in changes uh, in, uh, on a daily basis. There is an immense amount of resources out there uh, for exploring tides. You can get um, as, as uh, detailed as you want. Uh, we produce this uh, and, and others. There's some great uh, foldouts, um, laminated foldouts on the market. Uh, we're not the only ones that do it, but uh, the Beachcombers guide on the far right um, is a great one, one source kind of uh, resource. Uh, but then there's some great books to read if you want to get a little more of the backstory for some of these creatures. Um, one of the best ones is the field guide of the Atlantic seashore on the upper left-hand side. And that is uh, one of the Peterson guides. Unfortunately, unfortunately, it's out of print, but you can still find uh, used copies um, here and there, and certainly on the internet. It's a great resource. We'll, we'll uh, reference it later on. Other things you might consider, you, these are, you don't need these. Uh, although I would strongly suggest some sort of sunscreen or uh, you know, appropriate clothing and hat. Uh, but a tide chart would, would be really handy or at least know what the tide's doing. Uh, tray or bucket uh, filled with a, a little bit of water uh, can give you an opportunity to isolate some of the live creatures and put them in the bucket for a while for observation, long enough to, to get an idea of uh, what you're looking at, uh, and then obviously being respectful and putting the, the uh, specimen back into the same spot you found it. Uh, but yes, uh, finding a, a crab and, and, and getting it into a bucket and watch, watch it look up close using a magnifying glass is uh, just one of life's treasures. Uh, small container to isolate smaller um, specimens can be helpful and a scoop can be helpful as well. And then like anytime we're going into uh, nature, if you will, we wanna think about the uh, Leave No Trace outdoor ethics. And uh, there are some ones that are specific to traveling around our intertidal zones, especially things like dunes and staying off of dunes and vegetation on dunes. This is probably pretty universally understood um, but the one thing is, you know, there's, there's a, a temptation to bring back treasures. Um, and so you got to be careful not to, uh, to fall into that and, and start taking all these specimens home. Uh, often you regret it because they do start to smell many of them because of the nature of, uh, the intertidal, origin of these, things, of these creatures. And so here's uh, some raccoon. This is down on Martha's Vineyard at our Felix Neck uh, Wildlife Sanctuary. And there's some green fleece, which is actually an introduced algae or seaweed along our coast and some raccoon prints. Now we also uh, probably know a lot, of, a lot of these species here, but let's do a little bit of uh, dividing a couple of uh, terminologies here. So we have univalves, like this whelk here, that only has one chamber. Uh, and so here's another generalization. All our mollusks or shells have a calcium carbonate uh, 
make up. And so some shellfish choose to be a univalve. And if you are a univalve, you usually, your, your soft body is protected by this shell. And you are gonna look very similar to a garden snail. So you're gonna have a foot uh, and a, uh, some antennae, a siphon, that kind of thing. And we'll show you uh, in more detail what that looks like. Uh, or if you're a bivalve, you have two halves, uh, two shells that hinge, and you might either filter feed or siphon feed, or uh, you might uh, self-propel like our scallops. Um, so we'll divide that up a little bit as well. So here uh, is our bivalve. And bivalves, uh, like our fish, uh, breathe through gills. And they're filter feeders, and they gather food through gills. Some bivalves have a pointed retractable foot that protrudes from the shell and digs it down into the surrounding sediment. Um, and so it enables the creature to burrow and to hide. And they're pretty good at this. They can move a lot faster than you might think. Uh, if anybody has seen a razor clam bury itself, uh, you will appreciate just how fast these um, clams can bury. So bivalves even make their own shells. Uh, an internal organ called the mantle secretes calcium carbonate so that the inner invertebrate, as the inner, inner invertebrate grows, the outer shell provides a roomier home. They have an amazing ability to filter seawater uh, in large quantities. And so a lot of our bays are much cleaner because of these bivalve uh, beds. And so here are some of these species, and I bet many of you already knew a lot of these. So razor clams, and we'll talk about a lot of these in more detail as we move forward here. But razor clams, surf clams, Quahog, soft shell clams are, are uh, mollusks that will bury themselves in the mud and filter feed using siphons. Then we've got oysters that are colonizers, uh, rib mussels, which are colonizers, and they have a tendency to stick to the uh, salt marshes. And blue mussels are, again, colonizers. And they're, they're, you're going to find them in more of the rocky areas or anywhere there's a pier. Uh, that they can attach themselves to. So here's an example of one of our univalves. This is a dog winkle, uh, very um, much related to some of our whelks and, and what its claim to fame is uh, that it's shared with moon snails and some other um, univalves is, there we go. It's got this foot that comes out that can move around the operculum is attached to that foot and it's a trap door. So as the foot retracts back into the shell, that operculum closes tight and prevents any moisture from leaving the shell uh, and also protects um, the shell from predation. Then we've got these tentacles that come out that are basically feelers as all tentacles are. Uh, it's got a siphon. It also has a proboscis, and what's pretty amazing is with eye spots. What's amazing with that proboscis does, and inside that proboscis at the end is called a radula. And a radula is a, well, it's a drill. And so what, what dog winkles and moon snails can do, among others, is to uh, attack another clam or moss and slowly drill uh, a hole into the shell of its prey. Uh, some will use enzymes as a way to make that drilling process a little more efficient, very much like you would oil a drill bit if you were using a drill bit into metal. Uh, and it also, the, the, uh, another benefit of that enzyme is it will start to, once the hole is through, um, those enzymes will also help stew, if you will, the, uh, the prey. 
and then it's easy to uh, basically suck up the uh, nutrition uh, of its prey. Here's an example, and maybe you've seen this walking on a beach. You, you might find a hole that is, you might think is random. Uh, it's not always right in that particular spot, but often it is because that's uh, where the hinge is for shells. It can, the holes can be anywhere, but often they're up uh, to where the hinge is to weaken the hinge. Other things you might see uh, associated with uh, whelks are the whelk egg cases. And so here's an example of just a few of them. They look like, uh, well, they're described as rattlesnake-like uh, for uh, the channel the knob whelk. It's a string of these chambers. Uh, and uh, obviously, it, um, this looks way bigger than this whelks can possibly uh, contain inside the shell. Well, like many things that are exposed to water, it, it, um, it will expand quickly. So it isn't developed inside the shell as large as uh, this example on the left. But each one of those chambers will contain uh, young whelks. Um, and that is one of, the, one of the many egg cases that you'll find. Here's the moon snail. This is a fairly large snail, and this particular, uh, this is another snail with a radula. This one works a little differently in that it has a huge foot, and when it comes across its prey, it'll envelope or envelop the prey completely, and it takes about three or four days, but it will drill uh, the same, in the same manner as the uh, dog winkle. Uh, and what's another unique quality of, of moon snails is that they create these uh, egg cases in the upper left-hand side you see in, on the slide. Uh, they, they basically use uh, like a mucus uh, that um, they bind sand particles with and interject their eggs, uh, thousands and thousands of eggs in this cone. And if you walk along the beach and see these, uh, you'll be surprised at how resilient, resilient they are. You could even pick this thing up and handle it a little bit if you were gentle and it won't disintegrate. Um, and like so many other things in nature, uh, there, there are other whelks that will find this as a perfect place to lay its eggs. And so sometimes you'll invert these moon snail rings, if you will, and you'll see other eggs attached to the underside. Uh, just another whelk being efficient about finding another spot. These are slipper shells or boat shells. And these are unique in that they often colonize on top of each other. So they, they will stack on, on each other and they, uh, our filter feeders, you would think like a, they're similar to a chitin, if you know what a chitin is, um, but they don't graze. They, they filter feed by just lifting their body off the, off the substrate that it's attached itself. And whether it's a rock or a horseshoe crab or something other, other living uh, organism, uh, or if it's stacked on another slipper shell, they just raise themselves up a little bit and and uh, let the water flow through their uh, body where they pull out nutrients in the water. Scallops swim. They have amazing abilities to have these valves, uh, which create vacuums. And when they uh, basically um, use the, the hydraulic pow uh, power of uh, displacing that, that water in those valves, they'll propel forward. But, the, uh, the siphons basically are in, on the hinge side. So the, the scallop will move forward through the ocean. Scallops uh, also have many, many eyes on the edge of their outer shell, uh, bright turquoise. Uh, if you ever see them in the water, it's pretty amazing. Then we have the long neck or soft shell clam. We often call this a steamer. 
if we are so inclined to eat um, shellfish. And so it has a foot and it also has a siphon. And like many of our clams, uh, the siphon has two chambers, one intake, brings in water, pulls the, uh, the nutrients out, processes it through its stomach, and then dispels the seawater afterwards. The razor clam, again, this is our fa famous raz razor clam that can bury itself really fast and its ability to create its own quicksand is the reason why it can do that. So it essentially, uh, it's got a really strong foot and it pulls in water um, and then ejects the water out the split of its uh, shells. And, ex and that essentially turns the sand that's immediate uh, to it, uh, it's more, it, more like quicksand because it's now got water in it. And so it, it's more efficient to bury itself. So you could watch a razor clam go from ho sitting horizontally on the top of the mud. And as long as it's got water to deal, to, to, to work its, its uh, valves, if you will, it can move in about four, disappear in about four moves. Um, pretty quickly. And here you can see the great photo by a friend of ours, Amy Quist. And you can see those two chambers on the top. Of, we're looking straight down on the top of this razor clam. And uh, one of them is closed. One of the chambers is closed and the other one's open. Other things you might find are shells riddled with holes like this. And that's because we have sponges along the coast as well. And we often don't see sponges until the, the, the tide differential is quite large and you have access to some of the lower tides in the season. So some of those uh, spring tides would give us uh, depths that we would be able to explore a lot of sponges we wouldn't otherwise. In this, these holes are created by the boring sponge. And this is Peterson's guide here and the boring sponge illustrations up to the top there. And this is what a boring sponge looks like in real life. And it essentially feeds off the calcium carbonate. Along more of our rocky coasts, you can see there's these zones of predation, but also zones of where the tide comes up and what species thrive at each level. Um, and it's, <clears throat> you can actually see this uh, when you visit rocky shorelines. What you see will look very similar to this illustration uh, and that distinct of, of uh, isolated layers. So some of our uh, bivalves are colonizers. And so these are young blue mussels, a colony of blue mussels that have found a way to attach themselves to this established barnacle colony. And so these mussels at some point are spat, if you will. So they're, oops, they're, um, <clears throat> they are free swimming uh, as, as young after they're hatched as eggs, they're free swimming and they will swim around until they find a colony that's established or they'll establish their own. And once they start to grow, then they have this ability to create these bissel threads, uh, which are an anchors essentially, that they can control. Uh, they can shorten or lengthen them if they need to move around a little bit. Um, and so that's pretty incredible, incredible. So again, another filter feeder using a siphon. And this is uh, a photo of a razor clam with a blue, mus blue mussel starting to colonize this razor clam. And you can see those bissel threads with the anchors of this photo. Barnacles are a, an animal of a different color. Uh, they are primitive, uh, but amazingly adapted to a lot of the zones in, in the tide cycles. Uh, they, they pretty much will grow on anything that 
isn't moving. So you see barnacles a lot on, on piers, on the pillars of piers, and certainly on rocks and, and boats. And the hulls of boats often also have a lot of barnacles. And they too, as small, uh, young, will free float and swim around and, until they find a colony. Um, and they'll attach uh, to the substrate and then start creating with calcium carbonate, this uh, volcano-like looking structure with a beak. And that beak can close up tight and the barnacle can withstand long periods of time without being underwater. So uh, pretty fierce creature actually. And it filter feeds with its Siri. We'll jump to crabs and we will keep it simple here, but here's some generalizations. Crabs have 10 legs, five pairs, and one of those pairs are claws. And those claws can be very, very different depending on the species of, of crab, as we will see. Crabs have exoskeletons, flattened bodies, two feeler antennae, two eyes on stalks. They are omnivores uh, and they, if they live in the ocean, they breathe using gills. Walking crabs have legs designed to walk. And so their hind legs in particular look very much like the rest of their legs. And you'll see the difference when we talk about swimming crabs in a minute. But spider crabs, you can see by the size of their claws, aren't that particularly ferocious. And so they will eat pretty much anything, but they specialize in eating uh, seaweed. And often you see them in sea lettuce beds or grabbing a piece of seaweed as it floats by. And they're mouth parts look like a giant pair of shears. And so they're constantly feeding with these smaller front claws, uh, things into their, into their mouths. And this is an actual uh, molted shell of a spider crab. Blue crab is a swimming crab. We have a, a lady crab as well. It's a swimming crab that lives around here. Blue crabs, we're gonna find uh, more in Buzzards Bay in that area. We do get some on the South Shore. You, you, there's no reason why you wouldn't find a few on the North Shore, but they certainly uh, specialize in, in Southern waters here, Chesapeake Bay being famous for them. And you can see they have different hind legs. Uh, they have these uh, paddles or swimmerettes, if you will. And so they, uh, they specialize in swimming. Here's the underside of a blue crab, but this is true with all of our true crabs in that the, there's a hinge on the back on, on the bottom and the female has a much larger plate there because she holds eggs there uh, and the male doesn't. Um, so we'll see that in a minute. So these are green crabs. This is one of the invasive species that has um, found its way and very, very comfortable living in our uh, offshore waters. Um, they're one of our most prolific crabs now, along with the Asian shore crab. Uh, this is uh, three crabs kind of getting in a tussle. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what they were tussling about, but um, there's actually one under these, these two. Here's a green crab female with egg masses underneath that abdomen. What's cool about crabs is that uh, just like when robins return and the, all the robins find partners and go, mates and they go off and, and uh, build nests and raise young, the young are born pretty much uh, all the same time. And so you can, you can see, you can watch their progress throughout the spring and early summer and all of the young are going to basically mature about at the same rate uh, well the same true the same is true with with crabs and so you often find 
crab molts, and that's what these are. They're not dead crabs. They're just the abandoned shells of crabs. You often find them to be similar in size, especially their first year. Uh, they might molt, depending on the species, they might molt as many as five or six times before the winter uh, settles in. As they get larger and larger, adults will molt a lot less, maybe once, twice a year. And so they have this life cycle. They start off with eggs. Again, there's a, there's a stage where they can swim around. You can start seeing this is very similar to like our, our amphibians, our frogs. And you can draw parallels. And then uh, as they molt, what they do is they split the back of their shell, their carapace, and they back out completely. Everything comes out, the claws, the legs, the eyes, everything comes back out. And this is what's known as a soft shell crab. In order to get larger, they have to do this. So once they are backed out, they will absorb about 15% more uh, water in their system to, to basically bloat, if you will. They'll either bury themselves for a few days or go hide in some place uh, under rocks or in, in amongst rocks or uh, eelgrass, for instance, or seaweed uh, forests. And they will spend that time uh, rebuilding or fortifying their shell until they are uh, feel um, they can come back out and start eating again. They can be very vulnerable in this time when their shell is so soft. Anyway, so this is why you see so many uh, empty shells. Hermit crabs, they will uh, molt and their, their shells uh, will get hard, but they um, they have, through evolutionary process, have determined that maybe living in somebody else's shell works better. And so here on the right-hand side, thanks to Noah, on the bottom is a picture of a hermit crab outside of its host shell. And then you can see the illustration and the, and the photo on the top is they, they uh, sneak, they back into these shells and uh, use them as fortresses they can, those claws can basically pull back in and, and, uh, and close up the shell completely with just the claws showing. Um, so it's a pretty effective way to avoid predation. And they too will grow larger. And this is why uh, you can see sometimes these um, tussles or fights over shells. Um, so at some point they, hermit crabs need to find a, a larger vessel, if you will. And sometimes they're lucky enough just to find one, um, or sometimes they'll have to uh, fight and pull another one out and take over the shell. Here's a lady crab. And you can see again, it has those swimmerettes on the back. Uh, this is a beautiful crab of our shores. Baby lobster. And we, because of, uh, you probably heard this, the lobsters are becoming um, rare along our coastline in Massachusetts. The water temperature is warming up. Lobsters aren't particularly fond of warm waters, or at least our, our species of lobster. And so they, populations are moving further offshore to get into colder water and or they are moving further north. Uh, so. Uh, a friend of mine who's a scuba diver and, and has licenses to scuba dive for lobster says that he thinks the offshore waters of Massachusetts now look a lot like what the uh, waters off of New Jersey shores uh, did 10 years ago, uh, just in the, in the abundance of life and also the species that have uh, shifted further north. And the, and the uh, absence of species that are traditionally here. An amazing beast that many of us know is the horseshoe crab. It's not a crab, uh, not a true crab, but it is certainly a spectacular animal on the earth. And you can see, let's see if we can uh, get a little 
a laser pointer action going here. So here we can see the differences between the speed, the uh, sexes or the genders. Females have on their front uh, front leg have this uh, type of claw that looks very much like the rest of the claws. Uh, males have this hook so that they can uh, attach themselves to the back of the female uh, during mating. And some of the things that make horseshoe crabs unique uh, is, well, first of all, their age, they haven't changed to any degree evolutionary uh, for hundreds of millions of years. They have these legs that are used as they are trying to walk on land or underwater on the sand. They lift their body with these legs. They drive their shell into the sand or mud if they want to bury themselves. And then these pusher legs open up almost like, uh, well, let's see if you can get my hand here. They'll open up to push against the sand and then close as they move forward, push against the sand, move forward again. Pretty amazing. These, is, these are how they breathe, the gills. This is their mouth part. And in in detail, all of these legs have bristles on them that help uh, funnel food into their mouth. And these two little uh, claws will also continually move food into their mouth. The telson looks pretty formidable, but it's not there for um, fighting uh, or protection necessarily. It could be a byproduct of it, but this is to, to push them back over on their on their stomachs uh, if they get knocked around in the surf, uh, which is a fairly regular occurrence, especially uh, in the spring when they're mating. Uh, they're often uh, at the water's edge. <clears throat> this one has a bunch of slipper shells on it that we talked about earlier. Uh, and then one other thing before we move on is their eyes are incredible. So they very good at detecting uh, Variants, variations in light. So they have a compound eye here and they have several uh, simple eyes along their carapace. Uh, just an incredible, incredible creature. Uh, here you go. This is um, the underside. Again, this would be a molt. Uh, this is a female. Uh, females have a, tendency, have a tendency to be much bigger than the males generally as adults. Um, and this one, uh, uh, horseshoe crabs are different than our true crabs. Our true crabs, when they molt back out of the back of the, the body, uh, in horseshoe crabs, the front splits open and the creature moves out forward. Other than that, they're very similar in the way they approach molting. We've got clam worms, all sorts of worms we have. Uh, plume worms that build their own little shelter. Uh, there's dozens of species of worms that live in the mud um, that you might see the evidence of. Uh, they're a little harder to find, uh, but, but you can, if you spend enough time, you'll start to see evidence of, of uh, worms, including castings uh, and holes. Uh, Bryzoans are another uh, citizen of our intertidal zones. Uh, and here's one that's um, growing exponentially, jointed tube rhizoan. Here are those whelk egg cases again, but we have, in addition to the channeled uh, or knobbed whelk, we have the waved whelk egg case, which is, looks entirely different. Um, and then a skate egg, or some people call this a mermaid's purse. And so skates lay these eggs and they have these little hooks on them so that they get caught somewhere in seaweed, so protected in, the, in a seaweed bed or, or a like habitat until they're hatched. And then we're introducing this, this uh, term rack line. This is basically what the last tide cycle has deposited on the, on the beach. And this can be a really fruitful way to, to look at the beach and the creatures on the beach, especially after a storm on the front side of beaches. Uh, you get a lot of seaweed and kelp 
that grows offshore that we don't otherwise see unless it's uh, pulled apart uh, or dislodged in, in storms. So it, I would strongly recommend after we have a storm, even in the summer, um, to go to get to a beach and get on the beach side and just walk down the rack line. You'll find in amongst all this seaweed, uh, any number of creatures. Massachusetts is home to the diamondback terrapin. Uh, and it's in the Southern part of the state for sure. Um, but there are lots of efforts, uh, including what Mass Audubon's doing here and it's well fleet. Uh, sanctuary in restoring habitat so that this uh, diamondback terrapin, which is basically a denzian of the salt marsh, uh, it loves the salt marsh, and that's where it lays its eggs, uh, can continue to, to um, be part of our, our landscape and uh, through the efforts of, of Mass Audubon and, and others, um, terrapins that are are having a better show of it lately. Other things that are really cool, that you, again, uh, well, the sea lettuce you can see pretty much anytime. That's a uh, Alva lactica. It's one of our uh, seaweeds that, that um, obviously carries on photosynthesis. You can find some of this on the beaches sometime that's bleached out. Uh, so the green uh, chlorophyll basically leaves it after it's been bleached out. And then on those low, low tides, you start to get, and that's what this is underneath this uh, sea lettuce. With so It's got some mud and probably some bryzones mixed in there too. Uh, this is the red beard sponge that's uh, part, present along our coast, all, all along our coast, especially accessible at lower tides. Uh, in, in some of those storm tides we get uh, in, this, in this long rack line, we have some squid eggs here. Um, a rare sighting, but, but pretty spectacular. Here's that hermit crab. And you can see those claws protecting its shell. Uh, and then all these little slipper shells around it as well. Other community members that you're going to run into is the famous famous piping plover, which uh, is doing remarkably better along our Massachusetts coast, thanks to a number of organizations uh, protecting it. Uh, to use Duxbury Beach as an example down here on the South Shore, this year there's been 39 successful nests in that seven mile stretch, as opposed to two years ago where there's 28. And then the least turn is um, doing better on the Massachusetts coast uh, than it had, has historically. So things are looking up when we put the energy into it. I can see our time is running out. So I'm gonna uh, talk about seaweed a little bit and then we'll uh, wrap it up. So here is some of the sea many seaweeds we'll find all along our coast. So here's that sea lettuce. And this is kind of the description of what a lot of uh, seaweed looks like. Some is free floating, uh, but most of it has a hold fast, uh, a stipe, which is basically a trunk, and then the blade. So rockweed, you'll see this bladder, bladder rack and rockweed have these little chambers here. And as a kid, or maybe as an adult, you have found uh, it fun to pop them. Um, what these are, they do a number of things, but primarily they act as air bladders to help keep these blades closer uh, to the surface uh, so that the plant can enjoy uh, or the algae can enjoy uh, the benefits of being close to the sun. And then we also recently discovered the amazing ability for kelp seaweed and to a similar extent, uh, eelgrass uh, to trap carbon. Pretty amazing. Another benefit. We're also finding that uh, more and more opportunities are there for raising 
uh, kelp and other seaweeds for uh, food. And it could be a good pivot for a lot of our folks that live along the coast that have made their living as fisher folk or lobster, uh, lobster folk. And as species uh, dwindle, uh, if people are willing to shift over to uh, agriculture, there's some, there's some hope and a lot of potential in that. This is sea colander, and this is a uh, seaweed that obviously has been out of the ocean for a while, so it's starting to, to bleach, but you can see all of the holes and why it has that name, sea colander. So another spot, salt marsh is great to, to explore. It's uh, a little different in that it's got a little, the changes of a mudflat to a salt marsh uh, requires uh, freshwater influence. So the freshwater comes down into the system, bringing um, nutrients and detritus, if you will. And uh, the process of growing this peat, which is this dark uh, organic soil here, takes a long time. So there's very little oxygen in this soil. And because of that, there's, there's the things that grow out here uh, are pretty specialized. So we get uh, essentially uh, some salt marsh hay and, and uh, Spartina uh, antiflora and Spartina patens. And then we've got these ribbed mussel beds that like salt marshes. Uh, they're like our blue mussels that frequent our rocky coastline, but they specialize in, in growing in salt marshes. Salt marsh sparrows are famous. Uh, their habitat is, is uh, endangered and they are becoming much more rare, but there are places that they do well. Our Allen's Pond Sanctuary down in um, Westport, uh, this spring we had six salt marsh sparrows in our sites at once, and that, so that was very encouraging. Famous in the salt marsh and mud plants associated with the salt marsh are fiddler crabs uh, up the upper right here. And they have a very large claw that gets their name. It looks like a fiddle. And um, they, if they lose that claw, their other claw, their smaller claw, claw will grow bigger. And when during the next molt, the uh, lost claw will, will come back, but it'll be smaller. So they can be kind of back and forth, depending on how many times they've lost their, their claw. These coffee bean snails amongst here. Here's a close up of uh, that Spartina patents or salt meadow hay. This was used a lot by uh, the colonialists to feed livestock. Uh, it's, it's the often found in the upper reaches of salt marshes. It's not as salt tolerant as its uh, cousin, the Antiflora. And here is a willet, one of our few shorebirds, uh, in addition to the piping plover, uh, one of our few shorebirds that nests uh, along the Massachusetts coast. Uh, most of our shorebirds come past, they're not ours, but the ones that we see in the spring and fall are just passing through going up to the Arctic but there are a few that nest here and the willet is one. Uh, you can't mistake it. It's a strange shorebird and that it spends a lot of its time up on top of things. You can see this sitting in trees, on signposts, uh, on osprey nests, once the ospreys have abandoned the nest. Um, and it has a very distinct call and a flashy wing pattern. There's no mistaking it if it's in the air. We'll finish uh, by talking about some places uh, we recommend. And uh, as a uh, Mass Audubon employee, I'm gonna concentrate on some of our, our sanctuaries, but we'll throw in a few others as well. So starting on the North Shore, we've got the Joppa Flats, which is, uh, close to Plum Island. So these are other places in that area you should 
we, you should try out. Plum Island, Parker River National Wildlife Refuge, Crane Beach, Ipswich. Uh, in Gloucester, there's a number of things. Singing Beach in Manchester by the Sea, uh, Front Beach in Rockport. As we come down, we're not going to skip over Bar Boston Harbor Islands and Boston Harbor because that's a spectacular place to do uh, beach combing and tide pool exploration. So any of the islands uh, in, in Boston Harbor are great. Uh, Revere Beach is a great spot. Spectacle Island, uh, Carson Beach, and Wollaston Beach in Quincy are all fantastic spots. Fantastic Hull, uh, fantastic beach in Hull. Um, and then uh, we have a, a sanctuary called North River that gets you into an estuary, uh, long pasture down in Barnstable, beautiful barrier beach with big mud flats and, and uh, salt marsh. Wellfleet Bay uh, is like the jewel of our uh, coastal sanctuaries, a lot going on there. You can get out to uh, Nantucket, uh, Felix Neck in the vineyard, uh, Great Neck, in Wareham and Allen's Pond and Westport and Dartmouth. But uh, it would be wrong not to talk about some of the other places. Lloyd, uh, Lloyd Center down in this area as well. And any, of course, any of these beaches along here, uh, Monomoy, uh, Chatham, uh, the, the outer, uh, outer Cape is just spectacular with the Cape Cod National Seashore. Uh, the, the dunes and um, coastal forests uh, up in uh, Truro and into Provincetown. Race Point is an amazing place to check out rack lines and maybe get a glimpse of whales off the, off the tip here. Uh, just some incredible spots. Um, but with that, I uh, want to thank you so much for joining us this morning. And I will stop sharing. And Robert, if we've got some questions, happy to, oh, I'm gonna to have to turn this back into a. If you wanna leave it up, Doug, you can, it's up to you. But I okay, guess so we, we, we do have some questions. Great. Um, first question comes from an anonymous attendee who asks, are there guided walks available in any of these protected areas? Yes, again, this is gonna be self-serving, but, <laughs> but uh, every, because uh, Duxbury Beach is owned by a nonprofit organization, which is a pretty unique uh, situation. It's called the Duxbury Beach Reservation Inc. And if you can get to the South Shore, uh, they pay us um, to run free public programs every Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday from 9.30 to 11. And uh, I, I do those. and we, depending on the tide, uh, those subjects can be anything. I'm looking at it right now uh, in August. Well, coming up, we're doing piping plovers tomorrow. Uh, in August, things like uh, exploring barrier beaches, mud flat limbo, mollusk mania, uh, ABC of tides. We build kites in the very end of the season and talk about uh, the science of flight. Um, yeah, so if you, if you have the ability to get to the South Shore, there's those. And then there are other, uh, and we have uh, programs, just check out our website at Mass Audubon. Uh, it gets a little confusing. We have so many programs going on, it gets a little hard to navigate, but if you specialize the area you wanna check out, um, I, would, I would highly recommend if you're on the North Shore, looking for programs that Lisa Hutchings uh, does. She is an amazing educator uh, and she uh, works with all ages and will, you'll certainly enjoy a uh, presentation from her. Um, there are, I believe, um, interpreters uh, and people that work in the Boston Harbor Islands that you could join. And they have a, a pretty significant website as well. Uh, but yes. So uh, Martha is an amateur photographer. She wants to take photos of, of, of seals 
and she wants to know what's the best place in the state to see sales. See, I can't even see say this. See <laughs> sales. Where can you watch sa sales? Okay, so there's there's a couple of places that I would recommend. Again, both on the South Shore. You there's you could find them on the North Shore, but they uh, love Monomoy, which is the 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 spit of land that comes down off the elbow of the Cape. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> comes down off the elbow of the Cape. Um, a little closer for a lot of folks probably would be in Plymouth, um, Manomet Point. It's actually where a lot of the humpbacks are being seen recently. Uh, and it, it's, a, it, it's a, a, basically a cliff you can access this area um, and look down on um, a lot of rocks close in uh, to the shore and I've been there where I've lost count after 250 individual seals they're often if you get the, to the tide just right you don't want it to have it too high or they're all be in the water but if you want to photograph them, then like a mid tide is good. You'll see as soon as the, some of the, the, the uh, rocks are um, uh, available, when so the seal can get up without having to jump too high. So as the tide starts to go down and uncover those rocks, then they start he uh, hauling out uh, and you'll get, uh, you'll get some great shots. Uh, so we're going to take five more minutes of questions here. Uh, Marianne says, thank you so much. This was very enjoyable. Diane says, thank you for this presentation. I have seen many of these things on the coast and did not know what they were. Uh, Teresa says, thanks for the virtual beachcombing adventure. I learned a lot. Uh, Huck Finn, not sure if that's a real name, says, thank you, uh, full of wonderful information and a lot of fun. Uh, Renee asks, if the horseshoe crab is not a crab, what is it? Ah, it's a anthropod. Yeah. So it's it's uh like related to spiders and and scorpions and things like that. Yeah. Uh, Diane asks, uh, can you talk a little bit about ribbed mussels? I've heard that they should not be eaten because they are very efficient at filtering, and because of that, they are toxic. Yeah, well, um. That's a great question. I, it's more of a, uh, any shellfish could be subject to toxins. The, what's good is that uh, shellfish are similar. So if there is a, and they're closely monitored. So if, if they're shutting down shellfish beds for say, for instance, oysters or clams, then it's a good chance that you shouldn't be eating anything else. Uh, rib mussels have an incredible ability to filter, uh, especially nit nitrates out of systems. They just don't taste good uh, compared to like blue mussels. Uh, some people have, a um, they love blue mussels. I haven't heard of anybody that said that they liked rib mussels. They, they could be eaten, um, but I think more of a, I would shy away from them just for that reason alone. But yes, um, they have a tendency to filter out probably more uh, toxins than others because of their close proximity to the source in the salt marshes. That's, that, that's not based on any sort of scientific uh, things I've read. That's just based on, uh, that's my theory. <laughs> Uh, Cheryl says, uh, many thanks to you, Doug. Uh, Paula echoes uh, those sentiments. Uh, sentiments. I'm having trouble talking today. Uh, Shelly says, um, is the boring sponge hard or soft? It's soft. Hmm. Uh, yeah. Shelly, with a follow-up question, we're going to do rapid fire here, Doug. We don't okay. have too much time here. Um, Shelly wants to know, can you tell us a little bit more about razor clams? Can you eat them? Yes, yes, they are uh, traditionally. Uh, so everything kind of comes and goes, you know, with with what's kind of mm, 
what's hip, if you will, but a lot of uh, communities eat razor clams. Yeah, so you, you get your quahog, which is basically your clam chowder uh, clam. You've got your soft shell clam as your steamers um, and oysters, of course. Uh, you know, they're famous for cooking them anyway or not. Uh, Kimberly says, thank you for a great program. And it looks like the last question is going to Zoe who asks, where are there one tide cycles? Okay, so areas, uh, there, there's not a whole lot around here. Uh, uh, one of the best examples would be uh, the Vermilion Sea. So the Baja California, um, the bay is so deep that by the time the second tide would be coming in, the first tide still coming out. So it negates itself, basically. There are other examples of that, uh, but that's kind of the most famous one. All right, Doug, so it's 12.15. We're going to wrap it there. Uh, thanks so much, Doug. Let's give a Doug another big virtual round of applause for uh, being so generous with his time and his knowledge. Uh, folks, look for an email for me tomorrow with a link to a feedback survey, a link to a recording, and uh, some registration information about some other upcoming virtual programs, including one uh, with one of Doug's colleagues uh, next month who will be talking about uh, how we can better uh, live alongside wildlife. So uh, that'll be coming to you in your inbox tomorrow. So keep an eye on that. Uh, Doug, any last words from you? No, I just hope people have a chance to get out there. The, certainly summer has taken a better turn weather-wise. You know. uh, yeah, love to see you at one of our programs, but also encourage you to do it on your own because it's it's still a wonderful experience. And Robert and, and viewers, I thank you so much for this opportunity. Great. Thanks so much, Doug. Thank you, everyone. I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their day. Bye-bye.